Hey, Mike here with Canadian Musician, and on the line with me, all the way from Oslo, Norway, is Franklin Kiermeyer. Uh, Franklin's a Montreal-born uh, jazz drummer, composer, band leader, of great renowned. Uh, spent most of his uh, recording and playing career in New York City and now in Europe. And uh, Franklin's big breakout album was in 1994 called Solomon's Daughter. It's a jazz classic featuring uh, Coltrane saxophonist Pharaoh Sanders. And he's just released his ninth album called Further. But Franklin, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for joining me all the way from Norway today. My pleasure, Mike. I'm, I'm really glad to to spend the time talking with you. Definitely. And uh, CM readers may remember uh, in our November-December issue uh, this past year, Franklin was in our uh, annual drummers feature as one of the panelists. And uh, some of the questions, uh, some of the great interesting points uh, you brought up then I'll bring up again. But first, let's talk about a bit about the new album further. I should admit that uh, my jazz listening ear isn't as well trained as uh, I'm not as well versed in jazz as I am in as far as a fan and a listener as I am in many other popular styles but uh, one thing I noticed listening to further is it seems like a very uh, to me at least it seems very improvisational but is that actually the is that actually how it is what is the recording and writing process like for this album Absolutely. Uh, the the basis of what we do is is improvise. Mm -hmm. That's that's um, one could say that's the most important element of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and um, generally, what I come into a, a situation with a recording setup or or developing the music with other musicians is is, is usually just some sketches, mm -hmm. some ideas mapped out. Um, sometimes we use those. Sometimes those get uh, those get uh, put aside, and we, you know, um, depending on depending on how we are um, how we're uh, feeling at the moment, we might we might just. Uh, develop themes right then and there that we work with. Mm -hmm. But generally I have some very simple songs that I come in with. I'm always always uh, sketching things out and always coming up with new with new themes. For me, they're kind of like heart songs, you know, mm -hmm. really simple kind of um, prayer-like songs that make me feel like I want, you know, like playing. Mm -hmm. And we use those as, um, as a basis or a direction for improvising. Sometimes we'll talk a little bit about structure or form or, you know, orchestration, as it were. But, but generally, um, the key to doing what I am trying to do is choosing the right musicians to work with. And one thing that I've learned over the years, trying to learn from the great leaders, people like like Miles Davis and John Coltrane and people like that is mm -hmm. is the most important element of the music are, are the individuals are the musicians themselves. So what you try to do is bring together these forces, bring together these these individuals, and um, and provide just enough to kind of let it happen. Mm -hmm. You mentioned obviously one of the very important parts is the band selection. Uh, your current band, which includes uh, Azar Lawrence, Benito Gonzalez on piano, and I should say Azar is on uh, saxophone, and I, I apologize if I'm uh, mispronouncing Junie. their names, and J Junie <laughs> on bass. Yeah. Uh, how yeah. long have you been with uh, those three guys? Um, well, this is our first time all being together. Uh, I've known Junie for quite a long time. Uh, I met him when I was a uh, uh, a young man first starting to live in New York. Mm -hmm. Actually, did I meet him even before that, I think, perhaps? And uh, I've known about uh, Azar since I was a teenager. Azar, amongst other things, Azar is on some um, McCoy Tyner records mm -hmm. um, for people that might be listening that are not that familiar with the incredibly famous John Coltrane Quartet. Okay. Uh, McCoy Tyner was the piano player in that, Elvin Jones on drums and Jimmy Garrison on bass. And um, 
and Azar was in McCoy's first band after John Coltrane passed on and uh, made some very influential records in the early 70s that I grew up listening to that that were very, very influential on me as well as many other people. And so I've known, uh, you know, known Azar's music for a long time. And and Benito is is somewhat younger, and uh, I came to him through some recordings I heard with the band he was playing with, the saxophone player Kenny Garrett, okay. who's um, who's very active on the scene. And so, uh, so really, this was a this was kind of a hand-picked unit put together um, because of the qualities that each individual had, and we all have different histories with each other, but mm-hmm. but never never all played together before. Actually, Junie and Azar are both on those early McCoy Tyner records that I was speaking of. Yes. So this is the first time that they've been together since then, actually. Oh, very cool. And you mentioned when you guys went into the studio to record this album, you said you started off with what you described as sketches of songs, mm-hmm. themes. Uh, does that mean, for you, is that are those sketches, are they simply the drum parts that you'll be performing or bits of the drum parts, or are you also bringing in ideas for the saxophone piano bass Ooh. right right no what i mean i mean as i as i as i was trying to say these sketches or directions or ideas they take different forms it really depends on how it comes to me and 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 uh, what i feel is going to help us in the particular situation sometimes sometimes they're melodic fragments uh, most often most often they're they're melodic kind of harmonic sketches very simple usually only a few bars um uh usually written out you know on staff paper and you know some notes and and um sometimes less than that and like i said sometimes nothing like that at all everything like that gets put aside and basically just come up with songs in the moment you know and uh, could be as simple as you know, uh, sitting down to play and just singing something that mm-hmm. that that comes to you know that that feels right and working with that, um, but not not drum parts. I don't I don't really think in terms of drum parts. Mm-hmm. Actually, I don't really think so much in terms of of the different roles of 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 instruments. It really has a lot more to do with the unified vibe. Okay that we're trying to get happening and like I said the individual so it's not so much like I like I think okay this instrument will do this and then this instrument will do that and here's a here's a written you know here's eight bars for the bass and here's sometimes there's that but, but usually not mm-hmm. and when you're, uh, when you're playing and recording are are you consciously trying to uh, I don't say evolve because every every great musician is constantly trying to evolve. But are you consciously trying to always do something different than you've done in the past, or is it more just get the feeling of whatever comes out that day? Uh, is there very much thought into what you right. want to say achieve with the sound of the album? Right. I think that's a, a good question mm-hmm. because it can highlight. Um, the different approaches that certain musicians take. I think some people, some people that I've uh, worked with, uh, that I know, and that I've I've learned from, listen to, they may have more of a sense of wanting to explore different areas and develop or evolve in that way. For me, it's not so much like that. Um, the purpose of us playing music of us coming together is to get that vibe happening, get that feeling happening, get deeper mm-hmm. into um, that, with quotation marks, feeling. Yes. <laughs> and and that's, the, that's where the evolution comes from. For me, um, that the, the possibility of music really becoming great comes from focusing on getting deeper into the feeling. Mm-hmm. And then letting all the other resources, like your understanding and your uh, your 
practice, you know, development on the instrument that you play and and your experience is all kind of devoted to getting at that in the moment, you know, the freshness of being present. And so the evolution is kind of an organic thing that comes from that experience rather than following a, a more intellectual path of, well, now let me, you know, I was playing with five notes, now let me play with six notes kind of thing. Yes. It's, it's more like, you know, as we experience that um, that openness and depth and uh, and energy, the more we experience that and give ourselves over to that, the evolution happens organically. And so next time we go and do it, um, uh, hopefully, one would assume we've learned from that experience. And, uh, of course, you think about things and you develop, you practice, you know. Uh, um, the, the musicians I play with are, are, are extremely dedicated to their to the evolution in that sense, mm -hmm. but it's all for the purpose of getting that vibe happening of, of the feeling of the music. That's really what it's all about. Yeah, and on that theme, uh, before when we were talking for the uh, article in the magazine, you had mentioned I'd asked you about uh, or you know some of your early teachers and the greatest lessons you learned, and you mentioned a name, uh, Paul Duplessis, who's uh, <laughs> someone you learned under when you were very young in Montreal, I believe. And yeah. you said the something he taught you, and I think you said it was probably one of the greatest lessons you learned, was he said to bring the sound out of the instrument, not put it in. Yeah. Uh, in, in uh, I guess, more exacting terms, exactly what does that mean? Why was that such a, an important lesson for you to learn? Well, well, first of all, I really think that that's if I, I think that if I had to reduce the key points mm. of developing as a musician down to, you know, the three or four kind of cardinal rules. I certainly think that's one of them, mm -hmm. if not, if, you know. Um, I think um, that um, one way to illustrate it is if you look at very young musicians, mm -hmm. you know, kids who are obviously moved by music and then kind of, you know, um, start fooling around with an instrument, one would assume that what they're motivated by or what they're trying to do is get that feeling happening. Mm -hmm. that, you know, what makes them feel so good when they listen? Mm -hmm. Well, they want to get that happening when they play. Yes. That's why we call it play. So, so then if you watch them at first, most often what they try to do is kind of like hammer away at something. Mm -hmm. You know, they try to uh, put the energy into it, and usually what you get from that is kind of squeaks and squawks. Yes. You know, it's it's really obvious with something like a violin. Yes. <laughs> it's, you know, and it's really, I mean, there's so many jokes about that, and, there's, and it's really obvious with like a wind instrument, right? <laughs> if you try to like really blow a clarinet or a trumpet or something, at best what you're going to get is some kind of squonk that's not going to be very becoming, right? <laughs> very pleasing. Yeah. Right. So, so that's probably the simplest illustration on a very just kind of like uh, very mundane level of, of well, if, if what you think is, is how it works is that you're putting the air into the instrument or you're, or you're putting the sound into the instrument, then you're going to be fighting with it and struggling with it. Mm -hmm. If your, if your um, uh, philosophy or gestalt or whatever word you want to use, if your, if your approach to the instrument on a technical level is that the sound is already there, Mm -hmm. You know, that what you're trying to do is release it. Okay, you're trying to open up the instrument and allow allow the sound to come out of it. You're starting off in a much more a much more healthy perspective. Yes. So that that's maybe the most mundane way to look at it. I think on a deeper level, um, again, looking at children, it's 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 marvelous that they generally seem to have this kind of very non-conceptual understanding that, you know, sound, music is all around us. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's not really separate from being alive, whether it's walking, the rhythm of walking, or the sounds of water flowing or whatever. It's very natural, you know? Yes. And, and so 
that's more like allowing yourself to get in touch with the music all around us. And from that approach, it's obvious that, well, you're not trying to make music, you're just trying to open up to it. Mm -hmm. So now if you kind of look at it from a drummer's perspective, you pick up the drumstick and you hit the drum. That's not going to sound very nice, and it's certainly not going to lead to a flow of energy. It's not going to lead to what we call groove. Yes. But if your attitude is that it's already happening, all you have to do is loosen up and open up and let it flow, then you're taking a huge step forwards towards tapping in to that vibe. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, I think that's what Paul meant. Certainly, that's what that's what I took from yeah. it, and uh, and it's certainly a cardinal lesson. A very, very uh, feel as I think I mentioned at the time of the uh, when we spoke previously. I felt feel very fortunate that that's one of the early lessons I learned from a from a from a, a great musician. Certainly, and that's that approach, that desire to get that. Flow, that you know that freestyle that flow and groove to get into mm. the feel it's something that's very uh, associated with jazz music in a lot of ways not to say that it doesn't exist in blues and rock and roll and everything else but is that something that f appealed to you as a young drummer about about jazz that drew you into the style that's another interesting question i think i mean certainly yes mm -hmm. but um I am quite certain that the same is true of every good musician, no matter what instrument, no matter what kind of music they play. Yeah. I have a, a close friend named Chris Gecker, who's a preeminent classical, so-called classical trumpet player. Mm -hmm. Really great, great renowned musician. And, um, and he very much, uh, and, he, and, he, and he's a, a very famous teacher. Of, of other trumpet players, and uh, and his whole approach is based on that that openness and um, uh, relaxation. Mm -hmm. But I think every I think I think it's true of every musician um, who wants to get good past a certain point. Everybody comes unless they have learned this naturally. You come up against the resistance. Mm -hmm. and realize, oh, that's the wrong approach. It's not about, uh, it's not about manhandling, pardon the, pardon the expression, <laughs> I think it's a very good one, but, you know, it's not about that. It's about that looseness and, um, and relaxation and openness. I don't mean a lack of energy. It's just the opposite. If you really want to get uh, the energy flowing, then you have to loosen up. Mm -hmm. And that's true whether you're uh, playing um, playing Bach music or you know death metal. Yeah. I mean, it's it's true of everything. Certainly, uh, certainly, so-called jazz music has that as a very naked principle. Mm -hmm. um, so much of what. If, if if we're talking about the same thing when we say jazz, because that's a word that that is is you know can mean so many different things, yeah. but but generally, you know, when we talk about you know soulful music, we're talking about that quality being um, uh, uh, being uh, being uh, uh, the prime element or 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 one of the one of the prime elements, uh, you know really the purpose of, of, of playing the music in the first place. It's yeah. very it's very obvious. It's very naked. So and that certainly attracted me, yeah. Interesting. When we were talking before we were talk we talked a little bit about how you had pursued spiritual practice uh in South Asia and you mm. mentioned how you'd said that fundamentally <laughs> spirituality and music are not two different things, that they're very intertwined. And that there's a spiritual aspect to music. And, which is something I think a lot of musicians and music fans would certainly agree. You, even if they haven't put in the, the study, you can feel something about mm. music when you get really into it that feels spiritual. But it's that in a lot of ways, the fundamentals of meditation 
are not too different from the fundamentals of you know losing yourself in the music or an instrument. Uh, how did those spiritual practices or learning about meditation and every and I guess that sort of thing, how did that inform you as a musician? Um, it, it, it happened uh, bilaterally, I guess is the term. You know, on the one hand, um, trying, to, trying to find answers for, for the questions that at some point pretty much all of us ask when we're young. Mm -hmm. You know, what are we doing here? What's it all about? And being moved by music you know, loving the music that I loved and, and loving the way it made me feel, those two things, I think, uh, you know, not only cross-pollinated, but informed each other mm. and became, you know, it's always been a very natural, it's just what I've spent my life pursuing, you know? Yes. And, um, and I never saw them as two different things. It would be like, like saying that, you know, life you know life is different than the life you're leading you know <laughs> it's all one thing so so um and i i always felt that the lessons i was learning by trying to play music were life lessons mm -hmm. um and i always felt that the lessons i was learning by um looking at my mind and by trying to understand what this uh, this experience, what this life is, you know, were very much life lessons, and I never saw them as two separate things for for whatever reason. I just just never did. Mm. I think that, um, as I said, I think that the lessons we learn. I I, I assume that when we try to do anything well, really try to give whatever we can over to to pursuing something, mm -hmm. I think that we confront obstacles. Mm -hmm. And I think that the more honest we get about those obstacles, we see those obstacles as our own, ourselves. Interesting. And I think that the more we look at that, the more that just naturally becomes a spiritual, what we call a spiritual practice, you know, yeah. spirit. You know, what spirit? You know, it's just being alive. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, maybe answers the first part of, of, of your topic right now, your, your question. Is, you know, I think, I think pretty much every musician, people might not like the word spiritual, or people, you know, might like this word or not that word. But I think if you get beyond the words, I think pretty much every musician thinks that what they're doing what they want to do is spiritual, yes. you know, and, and I really think whether they're, you know, a, uh, whether they're playing Santeria, Candomblé, religious music, you know, or whether they're, whether they're Bata drummers, whether they're, you know, heavy metal drummers, whether they're playing in a, in a pop band in an arena mm -hmm. on tour, playing the same thing every night, Exactly. With with you know, I, I think that basically any uh, drummer, any musician, uh, anybody who really wants to give themselves over, I think it's all in the words we're using. Yeah. If you want to give yourself over to something, no matter how mundane a practice it might seem to be, well, it's a spiritual, it's a spiritual path. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 that's really what I think. I think that's the beauty of it is that, you know, anything can be an opportunity to watch your mind and to see the obstacles, whether they appear to be outside or inside of you is not really the point, yeah. and to work with that. So to me, that's what spirituality is about. And, and I think the more you do that and the more you develop a... Uh, rapport with that, the more you learn how to dance with that, then the kind of, um, the heart flows. The heart flows with, uh, with less and less obstruction, and I think that's the spirit, I think that's the soul, whatever word you want to use, yeah. and I think that comes from that emptiness, it comes from that openness. And that's love, and that's what this is all about. I mean, whether you're screaming about, you know, how, uh, you know, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to. <laughs> some death metal, or you know, the anti this or the 
pro that or whether it's wordless and you're just trying to play the most transcendent sounds you can or whether it's all about this or that or you're trying to sound like a machine <laughs> you know yeah. whatever it is i think that fundamentally you're working with yourself and trying to overcome the barriers that are holding you back so that your performance can uh, can become more and more immediate. You, you, you can experience the presence, the present moment. Mm. And that's when it's, you know, that's what people call groove or people call, you know, wow, it's really happening now. Or like you say, you know, it's kind of like, you know, uh, transcends the moment that, you know, and, and, and you've let go of yourself and, you know, all those, all those expressions that musicians use to talk about when it's really happening, yeah. I think it's fundamentally the same thing. I, I completely agree as far as uh, I think there's great truth in that, just having spoken to many, many musicians, that whether they use the word spiritual or spirituality or any of that, they many, many of them talk about music in the same kind of way, not least of which mm. for that same drummer's panel feature was Joey Jordison, Jordy, Joey Jordison from the band Slipknot, who's a heavy metal band mm. that pretty much no one would associate with uh, spirituality, but he talked about drumming and music in much that same way, and it shows that it can be sure. uh, that feeling can be that great, great uh, common denominator amongst musicians. Mm. Um, I, I think it's so true. I think it's a, an important point because it kind of brings us all together. Mm -hmm. You know, I think what happens sometimes is that the factions, you know, the different kinds of music and some people playing, like I said, you know, um, playing in arenas in front of tens of thousands of people playing the, the hip, you know, pop song that's happening right now. Other people playing Misty in some hotel bar, you know, yeah. uh, whatever the range, I think that there's a tendency to think that, you know, we're all doing different things. But I think that if you cut to the quick, it's all about experiencing that presence, you know. Mm -hmm. And when, when, when you talk to people um, before and after they actually play, uh, I agree with you. It, it, it's, if you get beyond the words, it all sounds very familiar. Yeah. It's basically everybody saying the same thing, you know, it's that feeling. Yeah. And uh, to now, I guess, get back to the more uh, to the album as well as a bit more of the, the technical aspects of it. So, uh, I'd seen online that uh, further, you guys have recorded it in only two days. And was it mostly done in with an improvise, a largely improvisational album and completely instrumental album like this? Are they largely done? The songs largely done in single takes, or was it so quick because you weren't doing any? Uh, Right, right, right. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the music that we make is live. Mm -hmm. It's we make, we play music. And so, um, the tendency is to listen back to whatever you record later and select what you want to put in, you know, what you want to put on the album yeah. that you're going to publish. But in terms of recording the music, like I said, you know, I, I'll i speak for myself. I mean, I go in with uh, with, with an agenda, but it's a, 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 a pretty sketchy one and pretty flexible on purpose completely. And, and knowing that what's going to happen is what's going to happen, um, knowing that it's a wonderful opportunity you know it's it's uh my band you know it, it uh, you know i i i'm fortunate to play with great musicians and that's what it's about yeah. so providing for that to happen trying to trying to create an environment for us to go further <laughs> so so that's what it's about and then you have a document of that, uh, you know, hopefully, um, that the person who's in charge of, of, of documenting, of recording, has done a wonderful job, and the facilities are wonderful, and the, and the, the wires are, are, are straight, and the microphones are clean, and <laughs> everything's great, and uh, the piano is wonderful and well-tuned, and so on and so forth, and, and then what happens, happens. 
um, one gets to a point where basically whatever happens is going to be good, mm-hmm. um, and you're trying to go much further than that, of course. Yeah. It's an opportunity, so you are, and I guess that gets back to the evolution. You're trying to give yourself over to it. It's exactly what we're speaking of. And, and then you listen to it back, and you select what you're going to put on the album and just put it in an order that, that feels right, you know, generally. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, so that's, that's kind of our process and my process, but that's basically been the process on the, the vast majority of what we've come to accept as the great jazz records throughout history. Mm-hmm. Pretty much this music, improvised music, uh, jazz music, is... You know, I mean, you could say it's predominantly one-take music. Mm-hmm. It's a recording, hopefully a beautiful recording. Uh, you know, a, a, a very, a very um, uh, high fidelity recording of what happens, yeah. what happened that particular moment. Um, and we can go and play the same thematic material right now as we do, and it will be hopefully even further. Mm-hmm. You know, it'll be it'll be somewhat different because the air is different, the moment's different, the the weather is different, the everything. You know, in life. Yeah. Um, but but we can we basically feel secure that what we do will be good. It will be it will be kind of beyond that bottom line, that arbitrary bottom line that we each of us as individuals have set for ourselves and and spent our lives kind of developing, hopefully beyond. And um, um, all the records that I grew up listening to, almost all of them were recorded in, in, in a lot less than two days, <laughs> to be honest with you. The greatest records, the, my, the, the records that have been most influential for me, uh, pretty much a, a lot of them were, I mean, uh, you know, were... Six-hour sessions. Some of them three-hour sessions. Some of them, uh, you know, were put together from a couple of days of six-hour sessions or three-hour sessions. Or that's what it is. That's what we do. That, that's what we do. Work. The, that would be uh, unbelievable to a lot of rock bands that I know. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about different. I mean, yeah. To put this in perspective, and and you know, this might be somewhat controversial. Mm-hmm. I think there might be a really big difference between getting together with Jimi Hendrix yes. for a couple of hours and recording that yep. and getting together with some other guitar player who maybe uh, grew up playing... Uh, Gosh, I, I want to be very careful of what I say because I'm not trying to knock anybody. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is that uh, it's all about the musicians. Yeah. And you know, the music I play, it's 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 live music. We we make music. Mm-hmm. That's what we do. We get together and we make music. Yes. And that's what it's all about. And that's what the records are about. Um, it's it's uh, it's that's what it's about. You know, and and and. If you listen to, you know, if if you go back and listen to older pop music, R and B, rock and roll, funk, uh, even hip, you know, older hip hop and stuff. I mean, if you listen to older stuff, although it's still happening now, but if you listen to stuff like that, what you're hearing most often is musicians that are, you know, basically, you know one or two takes, you know, they're playing. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's a bunch of overdubs on it afterwards, some of the stuff, uh, but but mostly, especially the old hits, rock and roll and stuff, mm-hmm. forget about it. It's it's people getting together for a three-hour session, literally, yeah. for a three-hour session and knocking out five tunes. Okay. You know, go talk to Carol Kay, man. You know, go talk to Hal Blaine. I don't know if you know who these people are, but, you know, go talk to the Muscle Shoals guys. Mm -hmm. Go talk to Motown people. You know, that's what it is, musicians, you know, playing. I mean, they, they, you know, what what did Tower of Power say? We came to play, you know? (laughs) And that's 
And that, I, I mean, I don't think that's been lost, but I think that it's been, you know, um, sometimes, sometimes in particular, in particular people's uh, upbringings and development, you know, that's not where they're coming from. They, 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 they perhaps could could lack that understanding that that's that that's really, you know, that's the real deal. Mm-hmm. You know, it's people playing. You know, it's it's not uh, not so much like um, like sequencing something mm-hmm. and then overdubbing something else and then listening back to it and wondering why it doesn't feel so much. Mm-hmm. Well, it's people. If people are listening to it, you know, it's 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 a, a human organism that's gonna you know it's, it's if you're gonna be moved if your heart's gonna be moved by the music you know. You know what you put in is what you get out. Mm-hmm. So don't you think you have to put your heart into it to get it out? Yeah. So, but that, I'm not trying to knock you know technology. I mean, you know, if it wasn't for technology, mm-hmm. even the one take records I'm talking about wouldn't have been made, right? Yeah. Because that's true. technology. So. And uh... technology is man-made. So I'm just saying, don't you know, don't don't we shouldn't confuse ourselves by thinking that. Um, something we make can take the place of who we are. Mm. The things we make are only tools, you know, tools for us. And uh, yeah, I think it's interesting when you start looking into what music is about, how it works, and what it what it really does, what it can do. Mm. I think it'll always lead back to this very profound human element. Yes. I think that if anybody's really honest about what, you know, when you talk about groove or you talk about energy or you talk about passion or you talk about courage or you talk about all these wonderful qualities and you go look for it in the world of music and you're really honest about it, I think you'll find out that it's been there all along and that, you know, root cultures all over the world have been riding that forever. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know... um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but this is this is these are just my opinions, of course. <laughs> yeah, and, no, it's fascinating. And uh, some you said there, and I might be reading too much into it. But you say when you, for example, when you and your band get together, you say you make mm-hmm. music. You say uh, you make songs or record songs or write songs. Yeah. You make yeah. music. Is there some? Is, and this might be getting a little philosophical, or uh, maybe I'm reading too much into this. But is there is, is there a difference between making music? And making songs, and as far as you see it in, in what you do, when you go into the album, you're not saying we're recording ten songs. We're just going to make music. In the sense, of, um, yeah. interesting point. I think that you know this. If I'm understanding your question, it, it's kind of kind of getting, but it's it sounds like you're asking about both process and about semantics like do the words matter what do i mean by the words in terms of when, when, I, yeah, think, when yeah. I think song i think you know it has a definite end and a, a definite start a definite end there's the mm. you know, the chorus bridge or, mm. you know verse bridge chorus whatever it is but music is more intangible it can kind of start and end at any place depending on how the musician or music right is right is that more right. of a mindset that you bring into it well, it's fascinating what you're saying, you know, it's fascinating, and I think that fascination is the point. It's magic, you know? Yeah. Like, like um, I think this, this excites me because, you know, what is the most evolved, uh, pre-planned music most, that most Westerners think of? Well, it's what we call like this let's say some people call it classical music or or even more like 20 20th century or or let's say Stravinsky or even more Penderecki or these kind of like um orchestral composers that wrote a lot of notes on paper mm-hmm. and then 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 somebody copied these out for like 60 different musicians yes and then somebody who spent their life going to school learning how all the instruments work and all this repertoire then learned how to conduct, which has more to do with rehearsals than it does actually standing in front of the orchestra. I mean, they have to put the music together. Yes. And then all these people are sitting there beautifully uh, dry cleaned and pressed playing this music, and it can be quite incredible. Mm-hmm. And it's all pre-planned. 
So, so, but if you really think about that, there's two qualities to that performance, actually more than two, but let's say two main qualities to that performance that kind of prove our point in this conversation, mm -hmm. if there is a point to it. <laughs> and, and that, first of all, the composer improvised. The composer, whether it was just with a pencil and a piece of paper, if he was that amazing and could just kind of, you know, play the paper, write out what he was blowing. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yep. yep. Which was, well, some of them could. Some of them can. I can't, but some of them can. I know, I, know, I know some people that can actually do that. They can sit down with a piece of paper and start writing out music that they're hearing. Jeez, okay. They're improvising. Yeah. Maybe they go back and, of course, edit it, but that's what they do. Yeah. And then... Some other, okay, and then the, the conductor and the musicians are somehow making it feel live. Hmm. Certainly the great performances feel just as live as Jimi Hendrix. Yes. Some would argue. Yep. Some would argue. So then how can that, first of all, let's go to the latter. How can that happen? How can somebody read what's on paper that was written some hundreds of years ago or a year ago mm -hmm. or yesterday and make it sound like it's happening now. Well, that proves the point of presence that uh, a, a great musician or a very good musician learns how to give themselves over to the moment, how to release the music from the instrument, mm -hmm. right? No matter whether they're reading it or making it up or playing the same song over and over and over again. Yep. They're always and playing. and yeah. right, and then the composer is improvising. He's do he's coming up with this these in hopefully inspired songs. You know these moments. Yes, and committing it to some recording medium, paper, a tape recorder, computer. However, they write music, right? Mm -hmm. So well, I guess what I'm trying to point out is that as far as I can tell, fundamentally it's the same kind of activity of giving yourself over to singing, mm -hmm. to singing, to, to making music, to, to, to singing uh, is the simplest way to say it. You know, if you look at a child who's just, just uh, unselfconsciously singing and, and letting themselves be inspired by how it feels. Yes. It's like this, 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 uh, this um, cycle, you know, of like making the sound and the sound feels good and you ride that and it keeps, you know, keeps going. Mm. So to me it's fundamentally the same thing. Getting back to what you said about being attracted to jazz music, jazz music, so-called, makes that completely naked. And it says, yeah, man, that's what this is about. It's about the moment. Very cool. Everything else is only a technique. Everything else is only a way of arriving at the precipice. Yes. Jumping off, that's what it's all about. So when I hear people like Hendrix, I go, yeah, man, he really knew how to jump. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes. yes. Right. So to me, that's what it's all about. Now, you know, these words are coming from somebody that is, uh, that's basically spent his life you know, practicing, learning, learning how to jump and practicing jumping to the point where practicing jumping and jumping, you know, became the same thing. Yes. Okay. So I'm not saying that you just, it's like a kid jumping because, you know, you give, you give everything over to it and that shows you're developing a vehicle for letting go. Right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so... So, so that's what I think. And song, you know, song is just like song is a, a word that to me means the most natural, the most natural kind of singing. Okay. And I think that everybody can get to that song inside of them that's very, very natural for them. And that's where the truth speaks the most for them. That's where they sound. You know, when people say, wow, he always sounds like himself, you know, or, yeah, I know who that is. I, you know, you hear somebody play and you go, man, that sounds, I know who that is. Yeah, yeah. It's people who have kind of really uh, learned how to let themselves sing their own song. Jeez. It's, <laughs> it, 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 it's That's what I think. Better to think about. And 
And it's true. The greats always sound like themselves. I remember seeing an interview with, uh, I forget exactly who the producer was, but it was a producer talking about working with the Rolling Stones. And mm. he was talking about Keith Richards' sound. And he said, before, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the day, the guitar tech would be in there with Keith Richards' guitars and amps and pedals and everything. And he'd be running through some Stone songs to you know, get everything ready. And it wouldn't sound like Keith Richards, even though he's using Keith Richards' equipment and playing Rolling Stone songs. But as soon as Keith Richards right. would come in, pick up that guitar, and start strumming, that's when it sounded like Keith Richards. So once right. together, there's something intangible in in the great musician that they're always going to sound like them, and no one else can totally replicate it. Mm. Uh, I feel like we've gotten <laughs> a bit off the original topic, but this is fascinating. But... No, well, well, maybe not. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe it's the same thing. The more you let go, you know, it's like, when, you know, so, so when I was a kid, people talk, talked about it feeling real. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, like, uh, make it real, man. Yes. You know, or like, like, you know, and, and, um, and I think that's what we're talking about, you know. It's like it's one thing to learn how to perform. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to give yourself over to where it's not a performance anymore, mm -hmm. where you're really into it. It's like, like I think that's what you were talking about, where you're really, you're really into it. You're really, you're really all about letting go. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I don't mean like you're just being wild and 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 being childish, you know, or, or ridiculous. What I mean is that you're really, um, you know, the, the obstacles that come up, this is, this is back to the practicing, back to the developing of getting to that point. Mm -hmm. You know, every, like, let's say if you want to use the Rolling Stones, so let's say you're a kid and you listen to, you know, you listen to Satisfaction. Mm -hmm. You go, man, I love that song, you know, do Wow, man, I love that. Yeah. I just love that on so many different levels. I love that, and I, and I, I, I was watching them on TV, and I want to play guitar. Hmm. And so then you pick up a guitar, and it just it doesn't. Even though it might be fun, if you feel good enough about yourself, it might just be fun. Yeah. But somehow, you know, it doesn't sound like that. It doesn't feel like that. And then if you go, but I really want to do that, then you start subtly dealing with the obstacles between how it feels when you hear that, you know, how it feels, mm -hmm. and getting that feeling happening. Yeah. Okay. They seem to be two separate things or, or distant, you know, one. They seem to be different activities. Yes. Hearing it and feeling it and actually making that happen. And one could say, well, the whole path is 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 to get you know to deal with those obstacles so that they're not two different things anymore. That what you hear and what you feel is becomes one. What you're what you're doing. Yeah. That's so to me, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And Franklin, uh, I've now kept you for I've kept you for almost an hour. It's probably getting late over in Oslo, but we'll wrap it up. But it's always it's always a thought-provoking conversation i love uh able to talk to you thank you so much for giving me so much of your time uh, i know it's getting late there and i really appreciate it thank you i enjoyed it a lot i always enjoy talking to you fantastic and for uh listeners once again uh franklin's latest album further is out now you can head to franklinkiermeyer.com to uh get the album and find out more and see performances and everything and uh it's well worthwhile. Definitely one of the most fascinating people I uh, have had the pleasure of speaking to about music. So, Franklin, again, thank you so much for this. Thank you so much, Mike.